Kyle Larson locks into Sunday. Renus VK has the most dramatic day on Saturday. Chevys have the best engines, and Graham Rahal is once again in the same position he was in 2023. Welcome back to Break Hard. My name is Matt. I'm fresh back from the Indianapolis Motor Speedway where I watched day one of qualifying for the Indianapolis 500 and it was a dramatic day to say the least. The fog in the morning certainly didn't help things. The sun came out and spoiler alert, still incredibly hot. It brings the heat every single time it pops out and it heated up the racetrack. Practice came and went and we saw a couple people go out and make some runs. Nolan Siegel trying to get his feet back underneath him. The Ganassi cars trying to find some speed but the real drama came during day one of qualifying. It started with Renus VK when he went out just around 11.30 a.m. Eastern time and crashed in turn three. And then he came to a stop in turn four, you know, two cars before Kyle Larson goes out, which I'm sure just couldn't have been the most comfortable thing in the world. VK's car then goes back to the pits and the team goes in there and rebuilds the race car. And we'll get back to that in a second because Renus had the most dramatic day. Kyle Larson rolls off in the sixth position in the qualifying order, and he goes out and he's putting down a respectable time. It would have been somewhere in the 232s, low 232s more than likely, but then on his fourth lap coming out of turn two, the car, you can hear the RPMs, and then it just goes, and that was kind of it. Power was dramatically reduced, and Larson coasted back into the pits, kind of leaving everybody to wonder what the heck happened here. It was it another engine issue, just like they had on Thursday, and they're going to have to go and re replace the engine once more. Turns out they did not have to replace the engine. It was a plenum backfire like we've seen a few times with the Chevy engines over the last couple of years, and Larson, while he didn't set a time, was still going to be able to go out once everybody got through you know, the first round of qualifying and attempted their first run. Larson finally did did get to go back out in the heat of the day after everybody made their first attempt if they wanted to and he goes out there and he lays down an absolute heater 232.539 mile per hour puts Kyle Larson P6 on the speed charts for day one of qualifying that locks him into the fast 12 on Sunday he will have a shot at racing for the pole which shouldn't really come as a surprise right he still doesn't use his tools which i think is absolutely hilarious everybody else is hitting the weight jacker and trying to make sure that they're you know optimized for the corners and the further straightaways larson's like i'm just here to drive fast and turn the car and that's exactly what he did and he put the car p6 overall which is incredibly fast it's going to be a battle between team penske and mclaren for this front row when sunday comes around and ultimately whoever makes it into the fast six but for kyle larson massive accomplishment for him hats off going out there and doing a lap in a really trimmed out race car is certainly not the best feeling in the world having to do it after you knew you were already on a really good you know, four lap average in the morning, giving up that advantageous morning slot as well, certainly couldn't have been the most comforting thing in the world. So instead he goes out there and lays down an absolute heater. He did attempt to make another lap or another run at it. And then aborted after the first lap and said they wanted to just go out there and learn some things. But at the end of the day, McLaren didn't get off to the hottest start. They still managed to get three cars into the Fast 12. They, uh, unfortunately, Calum Eilat did not make it in, but the Chevys are definitely, definitely the strongest engine out there right now at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. They have nine of the 12 spots in the Fast 12. Three other spots belong to the Honda-powered cars. But for Larson, he now has a shot at running for the Indianapolis 500 pole, assuming that he makes it into the Fast 6, which is going to be a daunting task on Sunday. If he doesn't make it into the Fast 6, I think that he is going to fly. I think the plan for that is for him to fly to North Wilkesboro and race in the All-Star Race. If he does make the Fast 6, that's where things get interesting. Because if they don't run him in the Fast 6, the worst he can start is P6 in the Indianapolis 500 outside of Row 2. If they do run him, he's going to miss the NASCAR All-Star Race, which of course pays a million dollars to win, the same race that he dominated last year and won a million dollars. So you kind of have to weigh it. Is it worth making a run at the Indianapolis 500 pole, or do you send him down to North Wilkesboro and have him start dead last on the field and see if he can win? It's going to be a real toss-up for Rick Hendrick and Jeff Gordon and a decision that they're going to have to potentially make Sunday afternoon. But enough about that. Renus VK, back to him. So he crashes at 1130. Car is absolutely mangled. You can see a picture of it right here. I took from the grandstand. 
not ideal for him. They go in, they rebuild the car using parts off the spare chassis. They send him back out. And then with seven minutes to go in day one qualifying, Renus comes back up in the line and he pulls his time. He said, I can go faster. And he did just that. One of the most dramatic moments that we'll see other than, you know, Kyle Kaiser knocking Fernando Alonso out of the Indianapolis 500 was Renus VK putting down an absolute flyer over four laps, locking himself into the fast 12. I mean, mere hours after limping and getting into the medical car when he crashed into the turn three wall. Absolute heroic performance by Renus VK. Shout out to Lee Diffie. Fantastic call on the NBC Peacock broadcast. Take a listen to that on social when you get a chance. I can't post it on here or else I'll flag it. But it's everything that you want out of a out of a call. Let the moment breathe. Only add when you need when you need to add in. And Something that NBC and Peacock did, which I absolutely loved, is they did not put up a timing tracker at all. They waited for that time, the mile per hour, to pop up once he crossed crossed that start-finish line and made for a ultimate dramatic moment. But he crosses the start-finish line with seven seconds to go in the session. Seven seconds to go is enough time for a car to roll off pit road, and Graham Rahal rolled off pit road with seven seconds to go out there to try to make sure that he would not be in the last row shootout, that he would not have to suffer through another last row shootout on Sunday in the hopes of not missing the Indianapolis 500. But guess what? Graham, last row Rahal, will be racing in or qualifying in the last row shootout on Sunday because they just did not have speed. 230 mile per hour average is the best that he could muster up. And that's not going to get you into the Indianapolis 500 or even really secure your spot at all. So he will be in the last row shootout. He'll be joined by Marcus Erickson, 2022 winner. Last year should have won the race if not for some really curious red flagging that went on from race control. He'll be joined by Catherine Legg in that 51 car from Dale Coyne Racing and her teammate, Nolan Siegel, the 19 year old that flipped over during Fast Friday practice, also from Dale Coyne Racing. So. DCR used to have a ton of speed here, and then they lost, you know, the guys that were out there making them go very fast. Uh, specifically, Craig Hampson, losing him certainly didn't help the team out. So now Graham Rahal will have to battle those other three drivers for a spot in the Indianapolis 500. At this point, if we're just going to place bets on it, Graham Rahal makes the race, Marcus Erickson makes the race, Catherine Legg probably makes the race. Nolan Siegel more than likely out. Siegel just has not had the speed yet this month, uh, really, and especially since his crash on Friday. Didn't have anything for them on Saturday. But yeah, it was a dramatic day. You had multiple Chevy engine issues, all of them backfiring in the plenum, assuming that's what it was. Chevy's you know, head of motorsport said that they're going to work globally on this tonight to try to understand what the issue was. It cost Kyle Larson a you know, a spot early on in the running. It costed Augustine Canapino more than likely a spot in the Fast 12. He was absolutely flying, and he was screaming on the radio when that plenum backfired. Christian uh, Rasmussen also had the same similar issue. He was flying just like his teammate Renus VK was and then had an issue with the engine. Really curious that all the Chevy teams had issues except for Team Penske, who makes Chevy engines Ilmore. Who owns Ilmore? Penske. I'm not putting a tinfoil hat on here. I don't think there's a conspiracy around it. I think that this is all just merely a coincidence. But it is interesting that that, you know, of course, did not affect the Chevy, other Chevy teams uh, the same way that it affect or didn't affect Penske the same way it affected the other Chevy teams. Somebody that did potentially maybe put on a tinfoil hat was Graham Rahal. Afterwards, he was talking to the media and said that the engine that Takuma Sato has is just doing things that he has a really powerful engine, I believe is what he told Jennifer Fryer from the AP. I don't know if he was insinuating that Honda gave Takuma Sato, their favorite son, a more powerful engine. Honda did dispute that and said that all the engines are given and then they're all serial numbered and then IndyCar hands out the serial numbers to make sure that there's no favorites for the manufacturers. Do I believe that? Mm, yeah, yeah, maybe a little bit, but I certainly think that some people get better engines than other people for sure. So our Fast 12, Will Power, Scott McLaughlin, Joseph Newgarden, Alexander Rossi, Kyle Kirkwood, Kyle Larson, Felix Rosenquist, Santino Ferrucci in that Freedom Wagon for AJ Foyt Racing, 
Takuma Sato, Pato Award, Renus VK, and Ryan Hunter Ray in that one off for Dryer Reinbold Racing rounds out your Fast 12. They will make their runs on Sunday. Fast 12 qualifying will be from 3.05 p.m. to 4.05 p.m. Then your last row shootout will be from 4.15 to 5.15 p.m. And then your Fast 6 will be from 5.25 till 5.55 on Sunday. Tune in because if it's anywhere near as dramatic as day one, it is must-see television. And that last row shootout was absolute drama last year at the Indianapolis 500 as Jack Harvey rolled off on a car that had not cooled down yet and somehow managed to knock his teammate Graham Ray Hall out of the Indianapolis 500. Jack Harvey is not in the Indianapolis 500 this year. He was there supporting his teammates at Dale Coyne Racing, which I thought was a little nice, nice uh, gesture by him. But overall, if you have a chance to go out to day two of Indianapolis 500 qualifying tomorrow um, on Sunday, definitely do it. It is well worth the $30 ticket. They raised the price this year. I know. I'm not as pumped about it as anybody else is. But definitely worth your time. Let me know in the comments what you think. Like and subscribe to the channel. Follow me on TikTok at BreakHard. Instagram and Twitter at BreakHard.